Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Gloostick channel. I make videos about Dungeons and Dragons lore full time so that you don't have to. Carrying on with the completion of the core monster manual, we reach the Helmed Horror at long last. This is a creature, or should I say a creation, that didn't appear in the game until the second edition of Advanced Dungeons and Dragons in Ed Greenwood's module called Halls of the High King, published in 1990. So I put them into the category of creatures that evolved out of supplements to the game. Similarly, they were further developed in the computer game Neverwinter Nights with an article expanding on them for the tabletop game in Dragon Number 302, an excellent issue printed in 2002. There has been two kinds of special animated armaments, one is the Helmed Horror, the other is the Battle Horror. Horror. So let's take a look at what makes them tick. Animated objects are nothing new to Dungeons and Dragons, nor are constructs, but Helmed Horrors represent lost magical technology in the game world. The Helmed Horrors of Faerun are over 5,000 years old on average, having been created back in the days of former magical empires. They're most often encountered acting as powerful magical guardians of ancient sites, left dormant for many centuries. Or they may have been trapped somewhere in a forgotten ruin or ob the objects or locations where they are supposed to be watching over long since disturbed, ransacked and looted. So when they are suddenly released, they go on something of a berserk rampage. Netheril and Amaska, two ancient human empires known for the magical power, commonly employed constructs to perform all sorts of tasks. But the Helmed Horror and Battle Horror were a step beyond simple elemental spirit bindings. A few examples of these ancient golems can be found in Dragon Magazine number 302, including the Glyph Golem, which is a template applied to any other type of base golem. Essentially it's, what, it's the magical symbols etched all over the golem and binding it to a particular location that give it far greater arcane power. If your character is approaching some ancient gateway and some sort of construct steps into view, lit up with fiercely glowing magical symbols and then blasts some sort of energy ray at them, it's most likely a guardian and they are also known as seal, uh, the portal or glyph guardians. These magical symbols and additional enchantments are very expensive to craft and require a high level spellcaster spending a long time and additional effort on top of what which has already gone into building the and animating a regular golem. Something spellcasters of the past could do because they were part of a magical culture with plenty of resources, support, patronage and a sharing of responsibilities. In modern Faerun, for instance, spellcasters of high level rarely have the luxury of locking themselves away for a year or two just to construct super powerful magical construct. Liches, on the other hand, such knowledge has fallen into obscurity, so there is the extra difficulty of having to first gather all the correct information on how to do this in the first place, a task which may take decades. Again, something that liches may occupy themselves with. Most mages will have to resort to reverse engineering ancient examples of these advanced golems. For example, the Old One Guardian is what mages call the still active iron golems of the very, very ancient empire of the reptilian creator race called the Saruk. Finding an intact and operational Old One Guardian is very rare, and managing to deactivate or capture one for further study is no easy task. Helmed Horrors are enchanted suits of armour, really old armour, but this is Dungeons and Dragons. Just because something is ancient doesn't mean it is more primitive, particularly on the world of Toril. The Old One constructs look like they were made by a reptilian culture. There are elven suits from the age when the Dark Elves were the leaders of elven society. The ancient suits from Amaska have glowing crystals and an almost technological aspect to them. The suits of Netheril have an appearance a bit like the anatomical sculpted armour of ancient Rome in some cases. Other are are fanciful, highly creative, decorative works of art. Others from places like Narfel look like suits of armour created for devils or demons to wear with leering faces, horns and spikes. These artefacts are obviously much more arcane than normal animated objects. They're also clearly quite different from your normal iron golem. Helmed horrors and battle horrors are deadly self-willed magical constructs that are absolutely remorseless. Basically, they're just like the Terminator robots. They will not stop until whatever duty they're charged with has been performed. As such, Helmed Horrors are usually encountered carrying out the duties assigned to them by their creators. Because these constructs are free-willed and intelligent, they are perfectly capable of assessing if their assigned duties still make sense. A simple command such as stay here and kill any intruders is fine, unless the site they are supposed to be standing guard at is destroyed by erosion or a volcano or something. Helmed Horrors, whose last orders are invalidated by some means, uh, may wander the world, even the multiverse, pursuing mysterious goals that somehow reflect their last orders. It is like this. This program becomes the foundation of their slowly be developing personality. It's the canvas on which they paint their mind, filled in with their reaction to events, locations and decisions they've made over many centuries. These are artifacts that can slowly learn and grow, if they're 
taken outside of the original environment. If their orders stay the same and the conditions don't change, they don't have any opportunity to develop. They just carry out the same process over and over again. But some of them do escape. For example, a hound horror that fails to prevent thieves from plundering a vault it is assigned to guard might assign itself the mission of retrieving all treasure that has been removed from the vault. What else has it got to occupy its, its, its eternal existence? It won't rest until it's got that treasure back to its original location so it can carry out its original orders. Otherwise, it's pestered by this alarm signal going off all the time. An interesting plight might, plot might involve a helmed horror disguised with leather wrappings, wooden face mask, and heavy hooded cloak that arrives in a town on the trail of the last part of an ancient treasure. Something as simple as a very old coin from a fallen empire. They can even uh, often pass for a living being at a glance if they're making an effort to conceal themselves. A helmed horror looks like a humanoid figure standing between 5 and 7 feet tall, wearing a suit of full plate armour. With the visor down, they, some might mistake them for some living being wearing a heavily enchanted armour suit. The telltale glow is there, but it's not unexpected to see magical armour that glows. On some helmed horrors, the armour appears exceedingly old, its glow only a dim gleaming. On others, it is shiny and well-kept with a magical purple light, sometimes flaring at the joints of the armour. A helmed horror can never actually speak, but it understands whatever language was spoken by its creators, and will have probably picked up another language along the way if it's left its original confines. This is so wide open to creative innovation it just makes my gears whirl. You can have a real bicentennial man plot twist. The helmed horror seeks full sentience, personal attachments, a soul. How could this process, this creation process along the path to becoming an immortal living being go? Can you picture a helmed horror that has had the innovative idea of installing living tissue into itself? But of course, it does a terrible job of it and the tissue sort of works a little bit for a while, then, well, it expires badly. And the helmed horror never installed a sense of smell or has not often really figured out why people keep throwing holy water at it, but it aggressively protects itself from people trying to infect it with rust. What if it decides that organic stuff is really so useless that it does other beings a huge benevolent favour and slowly works out how to convert them to mechanical versions of themselves, more or less? Of course, there would be a lot of really, really gruesome trial and error experiments along the way, but you know, it has... It had the best of intentions. <laughs> How is an artifact supposed to have any idea what pain is? It's just a strange behaviour. All the ne unnecessary writhing and screaming. It's no wonder it can never saw a limb off nice and clean with all the yelling and bleeding. I could go on. Actually, why not? A helm horror could decide the best use of its existence is to prevent any other being trying to create artificial life as it recognises the futility and broken nature of its malformed consciousness, creating created as nothing more than a soulless slave, it may seek to impress the true loathing of for itself onto any who would seek the magical rituals that enable the creation of more of its own kind. It might become a mage bane, a slayer of all who are fo foolish enough to dabble in the supernatural. A helm horror may go another way, devoting itself completely to whatever instructions resonate within the core of their being. They may decide to seek out ways to enhance their already formidable form and boost their magical power, finding and grafting other magical items to themselves, equipping their arms with retractable warp blades, enhancing their armour with enchantments as powerful as they can find. It may be that the only beings who can give new instructions are those who created it. So, to free itself from the eternal compulsion to perform a senseless task, it may seek to bring its creators back from the dead by any means necessary. This may have been one of the original instructions programmed into the Helmed Horror, but it was previously prevented from or could not find a way to carry out the task. If the Helmed Horror, your character just freed from a dungeon complex, just raced off to some other dusty antechamber, they may be able to intone, uh, may not be able to intone the eldritch words of a resurrection ritual, but they can wake up the mummy who can. Placing a Helmed Horror at a location where it is instructed to disturb a tomb and wake up a bunch of undead, if there are intruders, an excellent twist on the encounter. Placing a Helmed Horror made out of solid gold in a submerged area where it can release some chul or other aquatic terrors is on, on interlopers, well, that could be a very difficult situation indeed. Helmed horrors may be driven and intelligent, but they're frequently misguided and slow to learn new concepts, very slow, particularly in combat. When in combat, they rely on their pre-programmed instincts, often seeming to react in split seconds with elaborate and precise tactics, but also completely ignoring glaring tactical advantages because they're outside of the set of instructions. For example, they may ignore that by pulling on some tree roots that have weakened a roof section, they could collapse a stone bridge and the characters that are standing on it plunging them into a deep chasm. Though the players need not be informed, that the Helm Horror is incapable of figuring this out, I encourage you to spice the situation with your own assumptions of the worst possible scenarios. 
Actually, that's solid advice for any role-playing game. The players also um, always do the best job of freaking themselves out. You really just need to leave them to their paranoid whispers and frantic exchanges of little scraps of notepaper and private text messages. Helmed Horrors have the power of flight, which is not that common for a metal construct. At the start of combat, they will assess which targets have the capacity to make ranged attacks and concentrate maximum aggression against those foes first. They'll take to the air and zero in on spellcasters, anyone with a missile weapon drawn on them on them, or failing that, seek out uh, to take out the weakest foes first, reducing the overall number of enemies that they face. They always have a magical weapon such as a polearm, a sword, or a great axe, and any weapon they pick up and use is imbued with the same magical power that animates them. It doesn't confer any special powers to the weapon through it, it just makes the weapon count as a magical weapon attack. They're completely immune to magic, missile, and other force, necrotic, or poison-based damage. The suit they're made from is either masterwork adamantine, or metal, or otherwise enchanted to be as durable as it can be, if not always immune to corrosion itself. They are resistant to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks that aren't adamantine themselves. As constructs, they can't be blinded, charmed, deafened, frightened, paralyzed, petrified, poisoned, stunned, and have an armor class of 20, assuming that they're using a shield, but 18 if they're not. They have 8d8 plus 24 hit points, so from 32 hit points for an ancient rusty pile of scrap to 88 hit points for one in prime condition. Feel free to add area enchantments if they're still located at the place where they were created to guard, which provide magical regeneration. Have it tied to glowing runes on the walls or some sort of a humming urn or a statue with glowing gemstone eyes that gives the players some interesting tactical targets to go for. Fights with single opponents, always better when you have extra introduced complications, movement and uh, difficult terrain, as well as other creatures who arrive midway through the combat to harass the party of characters, because a fight with a Helm Horror is likely to cause a lot of banging, squealing of metal on metal and showers of sparks. Horrors, uh, Helmed Horrors fly at 30 feet per round, they have a strength of 18 and can certainly grapple enemies and shove them over the ledge of a chasm or push them into a pit trap. They can fly up through a hole in the roof and activate a large barrel of acid that pours through the other many holes in the roof onto the characters down below. They can move over sections of floor that are unstable, electrified, covered in baby mimics that disguise themselves as floor tiles. The possibilities are endless. On top of their other enchanted features, the Helmed Horrors for 5th edition are totally immune to three spells of the Dungeon Master's choice. Heat Metal is a no-brainer. Disenchant is a sneaky one. Fireball is also a good choice. I suggest you be a little bit unfair with more powerful adventuring party and reserve one of the spell slots to be a wild card resistance you reveal during combat. The first time one of the characters uses their most reliable ranged combat spell against it, from then on that resistance is fixed, along with two other spells you already noted down. This way, it's kind of a, it functions like a legendary resistant that forces the spellcaster to switch up their normal tactics. They'll not thank you for the change of pace at the time, of course, but it's likely um, then, well, they're never going to give you inspiration points to DM anyway. Helmed Horrors have resistance to all magical attacks and effects anyway, so the spellcaster is not going to have a fun time fighting these things. In 5th edition, the Helmed Horror has two attack actions each round, so it can swing with its longsword, which is uh, plus 6 to hit and 1d8 plus 4 slashing damage, fly or walk 30 feet and attack another target. For instance, you could swap out one of these attacks for some other action, such as following its instructions and releasing a lever that floods the area with toxic, thick black gas. Since the Helmed Horror is, has 60 foot uh, blind sight, it can't actually see anything beyond this point since it doesn't have any eyes. It's actually a bit unclear if it can hear anything beyond 60 feet. If you decide it can, then it has a passive perception of 14 pa past the 60 foot blind sight zone. Also, keep in mind that unless otherwise informed by other er allies in the area, it will not know if it has other enemies more than 60 feet away from it. If they've not yet approached closer, it may not be innovative enough to connect ranged attacks hitting it it, with the fact there are more enemies further away from it that is not yet detected. It's it's detecting the attacks hitting it, it just doesn't know where they're coming from. Players who have a high arcana lore check will know that it's got limited senses, and as a DM, don't just hand them the great tactic like that. Let them figure out for themselves that the Helmed Horror isn't actually reacting to the ranged attackers it can't see. Battle Horrors look a lot like Helmed Horrors, but they have no lower body, just arms, torso, and head with a ball of energy blow that they hover around and fly with. They also have ranged spell-like energy attacks that they can typically cast um, magic missile at will, cast blink three times a day, and dimension door once per day. 
I'm a big fan of Witch Bolt and love the idea of a battle horror just being able to lock on and send out a wicked arc of deadly power round after round, still defending itself with a single melee attack each round as well. Battle horrors are sometimes employed for similar tasks as Helmed Horrors, but they're more off on a functioning uh, roaming assassin and war machine assigned to slay their master's enemies. I am uh, much more prone to giving them more exotic weapons, such as magical metal nets that burst into flame on contact with their target, or whips that shed poisonous paralyzing barbs. A helmed horror is built from a suit of masterwork full plate armor. After procuring the armor, the creator must animate it via an extended magical ritual that requires the special prepared laboratory or workroom that is similar to an alchemist laboratory and costs no less than 500 gold pieces to establish. The ritual also gives the armor a plus three enchantment bonus. So there is a chance of encountering one of these workshops and finding a failed ritual attempt with a very good suit of armor just lying around, surrounded by all these arcane components, possibly the undead and mutated wretch that could uh, used to be the spell ch- caster who rolled some serious natural ones on their ritual casting checks. They may even have left a unleashed but trapped uh, malevolent elemental spirit in the area that attacks anybody who enters. Helmed and battle horrors with more hit dice can be created, but each additional hit die adds another 5,000 gold pieces to the price and increases the difficulty of the ritual. Strong transmutation magic is involved and the caster needs to be a high enough level to summon and bind a malevolent elemental spirit into the armor during its creation, with magical components, wards and circles involving 75,000 gold pieces worth of rare and obviously very expensive expendables. The battle horror also requires an even stronger enchantment on the armor used to house the elemental spirit but that is impossible in 5th edition so perhaps require some other cost such as having to sacrifice living beings during the binding ritual. Thankfully the magical uh, ritual used to create these weapons of a bygone age are now extremely hard to find. Buried in ancient vaults, lost in dusty shelves of ancient libraries, the rumors of their existence abound and if a wizard has a good reliable lead on where to find this knowledge and where to rediscover it they are likely to seek out a band of gullible fools. I'm I mean, stout and noble heroes to seek out and bring it back to them, you know, so they can better serve and protect the kingdom for the greater good and all that. Hmm, that's 100% accurate. Yes, yes. Another possibility, which I present to you, (laughs) is the potential birth of a genie. Now, the creation of one of these constructs involves the binding of a a, a malevolent elemental spirit. It also involves some pretty heavy uh, investment of will by the spellcaster in this ritual, which could result in their possible death. I presented a magical mishap, potentially, where they summon a uh, malevolent elemental spirit, which is way more powerful than they intended, and it somehow in the creation process binds their soul into the Helmed Horror. Now the Helmed Horror may be uh, successful per se, it may not have received any instructions because the spellcaster died before it got to do it, Uh, but it's got a certain amount more free will than your average Helmed Horror and goes on the rampage. When it's destroyed eventually, the destruction of its physical body basically releases this fused spirit of elemental spirit and the uh, the soul of the caster creating a genie. So yeah, that's just a possibility for you. Like, subscribe, check out my Patreon for some exclusive content and all the full scripts for these videos. Buy some merchandise, get your deeply nerdy uh, t-shirts, uh, wear your geek with pride. Check out Patron Blades for a mighty smooth shave. Check out and buy a Discord server, come say hi, run some games there. As always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.